Good evening. Welcome to the Sunday evening services of Benton Church of Christ. If we have visitors, we are certainly glad that you are with us and hope that you will be back at any time you have opportunity. I uh, don't have any updates on sick, so I guess that's a good thing if things are going well. And uh, the only announcement I really have that concerns our time together tonight is that the Sunday night children's class for grades K through 3 will be resuming tonight. So if you're in that, uh, Jim will uh, let you go at the appropriate time, the song before our lesson. So we are glad you're here. We welcome those listening on radio and watching on WIT or watching on the World Wide Web. So we are thankful and glad that we can provide those opportunities. All right, I think most everyone is gathered in. Jim Kelly be leading our singing, so Jim, we'll turn it over to you. Four hundred and sixty-nine. Faith is the victory. He kept along the hills of life. He Christian soldiers died and pressed the battle.
Our Heavenly Father, we come assembled again here this afternoon to hear another portion of your word and study your word. May each one of us now accept this word and ex use it in our everyday life to help us make better Christians of ourselves and those around us. Our Heavenly Father, I would like to pray for our country. Father, you know the shape it's in and you know where we're heading. And there is some Christians that truly don't want to go there. Our Heavenly Father, we know there's people among us that are hurting. And there are people that are sick. People that are unfaithful. And we ask that you would be with them, bring them back, and be with those that are hurting and those that are sick and heal them if it be your will. Our Heavenly Father, we know we say and do things we shouldn't. We hear things and we repeat them we shouldn't. You know what we do before we even think it, but please forgive us when we fail you. Go on with us now through the rest of this service and forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Five six zero oh, five hundred and sixty. The our children now may go to class. We'll sing this song prior to uh, our scripture reading and our lesson. Let's stand for the song, please. I will be saved. I care not today what tomorrow may bring. This evening is found in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go with him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, let me, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. 
I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is, he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to whom who knocks it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You may be seated. Good evening. It's good to see everyone today. I hope you had a good afternoon. I hope it went well. And uh, it's wonderful for us to be together together tonight to sing songs of praises and to study a message from his word. As you and I are in our Bibles, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 11 and look at this parable fairly close. It's a very interesting parable as we run across it. And especially it's interesting when we bring it to today and uh, look at today's application as well. As you and I know, as we look at the book of Luke, we see it is the longest book of the New Testament. A lot of times when we think about who wrote the most of the New Testament, we think of Paul, and we think, man, you know, the guy wrote about 12 books out of the 26. Surely he wrote the most. Well, he's not the longest or the most uh, prolific writer of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, Luke is the most prolific writer of the New Testament. As you and I look through our Bibles, we see the longest book in the New Testament is the book of Luke. It only has 24 chapters, but you'll notice each chapter has about 62 or sometimes 75 verses to it. So if you lay it out in English, and especially if you lay it out in Greek, Luke is the longest book of the New Testament. The next longest book of the New Testament is the book of Acts, also written by the physician Luke. And it's interesting, it has 28 chapters, which makes it equal to the book of Matthew. And yet Luke is a little bit longer when you lay out the words and a text. So Luke and Acts work together to fill about a third of the New Testament. So if you're working on your daily Bible reading, you make it through Luke and Acts, you are a third of the way there. The reason why he wrote this way, of course, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but you also see that he is a physician. He is a very, very educated man. Among all the gospel writers, the ones who would be most educated would be Luke and also John. John, you can see his education and the simplicity of his writing. Luke, you can see the, his education and the uh, details which he has there. Maybe you remember some time when you visit the doctor's office. Hopefully you go at least once a year to see the doctor. And the doctor will begin telling you about drugs and telling you about uh, symptoms and things such as that. And every once in a while they'll come across a word and you have no idea what in the world that means. Right? Has that ever happened to you all? happens to me every once in a while. They'll say, well, you know, you deal with this and da-da-da-da-da, and you think, I don't know what that is. Probably start, better start eating more vegetables. I think that's just how you translate that word. And so that's the way Luke was, and it's very exact, especially when you go through the book of Acts and see how that is. Well, anyway, as you go through here, we see that Luke is spending the time here in Luke chapter 11, especially the first half of it, talking about prayer. Notice with me, if you will, as you begin looking at Luke there, in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, one of the strangest questions, I think, or one of the strong, strangest requests, I think, is found there. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, isn't that interesting? We have song leading classes, and we really work hard in teaching our young men to lead singing. You got to have the right pitch, the right tonal area to start with. You got to go at the right pace. You got to move that hand in just the right way, and you got to know when to change the verses. That's pretty complicated stuff, and it takes a lot of work to figure it out. Uh, we have a lot of young men's training classes talking about preaching, right? You got to learn how to preach in an expository way that is, taking the scriptures and letting the scriptures speak through you rather than taking passages out of context. Sometimes you preach in a topical way where you'll find a subject and you'll find what in the Bible supports that subject and lets us know about what the Bible teaches about that subject. And many people have written many books and taught many lessons and a lot of college degrees have been given trying to teach people exactly how to preach. 
I've been in a young men's training class where we spent a lot of time training about how to do the Lord's Supper. It looks very simple until you're in front of 300 people and you're trying to figure out if you need to go to that row or that row, right? And every once in a while we mess something up as we go through and we mess something up on the trays. It's complicated stuff as we go through there. And oftentimes we'll talk about giving and we'll remind one another about the importance of giving. Giving is not a symbol of the approval of the elders and the preachers. Giving is not a symbol of, hey, we want to pay for these physical things. Giving's an act of worship. But perhaps one of the most neglected parts of Christianity, especially of the five acts of worship given to us in 1 Corinthians, is prayer. Because oftentimes we think prayer's natural. You know, how hard can it be? Stick your hands together, close your eyes, unless you're driving while you pray, and you begin to just talk to God. And tell him exactly what you need and tell him what you're dealing with in life. And a lot of times we think, man, prayer is simple and prayer is easy. And because of that, oftentimes prayer is neglected. Oftentimes we say, well, prayer ought to be something we do easily. But then at the end of each day, we look back and we realize, you know, I didn't really pray very much. Didn't really think very much about asking God or talking to God during these times. And prayer tends to be something that we neglect. And I say it oftentimes, and preachers get in trouble for saying the same thing over and over. It looks like we hadn't studied. But, you know, you and I, we look at prayer. And if you have a question about where the faith is in your life and how much you trust in God, the easiest measure and one of the most effective measures is how much you pray and what you pray about. When you find yourself praying out of memory, that is, pray it before your meals and pray before you go to bed, you're not praying the way you should. Yes, Jesus blessed the food every single time he ate in Scripture. And yes, that's something we should do. Yes, the very first thing you need to do in the morning when you get up and the very last thing you need to do when you go to bed at night is pray to God and thank him for the day and thank him for your opportunities. But prayer is more than just the rote times in which you act. Prayer is a sharing with God to let him know what you're going through to converse with him about what you're struggling with in life, to grow in him, to grow in faith. It's not just important to pray three times a day like Daniel did. It's important to pray to God about the things that we're struggling with in our life. If you're married, be sure to pray for your spouse every single day. If you're a member of the Lord's church, be sure to pray for your preacher, that's biblical, Ephesians 6, 18. And also to pray for the elders, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, every single day. If you're human, pray for your enemies. Be sure to pray for them. Now don't be like James and John and pray that thunder and hail may come down upon them. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about pray for our enemies. Pray that God will love them. Pray that they will come to a better understanding and pray that God will bless them in all things. You and I need to become a people of prayer. And we here at Benton must become a church of prayer. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We'll study that verse here in a little bit. But prayer is something which is necessary. And so we see there in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. And we see where Luke gives Jesus' model prayer. It's the exact same thing, almost, as what you see over in Matthew chapter 6. A few significant differences. Sometimes you will recall that um, people will quote the Lord's Prayer. And they'll say, well, Jesus told us to pray like this. And they forget that just a few verses later in Matthew 6, when Jesus says this is model prayer, he says, don't repeat things in vanity. In other words, mean what you pray. Don't just repeat a rosary or repeat a prayer book or repeat a verse. But use your heart and put your heart into it. But also we see that as you and I think about this model prayer which is here, Jesus did not intend for this model prayer to be repeated by us each and every day. Because the model prayer in Matthew 6 is not worded in the exact same way as the model prayer found there in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. And so study these two passages and look for the principles. Look for the subject matter and look for the attitude used in prayer. Pray to God to give you your daily bread. Pray to God that you may forgive other people. 
Pray to God that He may guide you and lead you in the ways in which you need to go. All right, that gets us over here to verse 5. And bringing this to today, all right, imagine you go to bed tonight and perhaps around 2 o'clock in the morning, you have somebody at your door. What do you do? You cock the trigger on the gun, right? Okay. Not that we would ever shoot anybody. Okay. You wake the dog up and convince the dog, I have fed you for the last three years. Finally do your job. Maybe your dogs aren't that way. Mine is. You know, every once in a while you got to say, man, you just got to get tough. This morning we had a stray cat show up in my backyard. Try to get the dog after it. The dog ran away. I thought, we've got issues. I don't know if they have a manliness school for dogs or not, but if there is one, our dog needs it. What do you do when somebody knocks at the door? I wake my wife up, get her ready, and I go hide. Not really. You get ready because this is going to be something scary. This is something dangerous. This is something you need to be careful about. What if you know that that person who knocks on the door knows you and knows that you need something? Are you going to get out of bed? Not if you can help it, right? Because my bed is comfy. And it takes me a while to get my sheets just right. It make, takes a while for me to get settled. And when I go to bed, I don't want to get out of bed because it is really uncomfortable to get out of bed. But what if this person keeps knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking? Eventually, you either shoot the guy or you answer the door so the knocking stops, right? And that's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. Now, of course, he's not talking about shooting the guy, but he says eventually you bug somebody long enough and aggravate somebody long enough, they're going to give you what you want just to get you out of the way, just to get it finished and to get it done. And Jesus explains the parable going on afterwards, and he says, listen... A lot of men are not good. They're evil. Not that they're uh, just horrible people, but they don't have the right priorities and the right mindset. But most people with their children want what's best for them. And if they need bread, they're going to give them bread. If they need an egg, they're going to give them an egg. If they need something to eat, they're going to find a way to help that child to eat. And Jesus says, recognize that the Father, God, is on your side. He loves you, and He's going to take care of you and make sure that you're okay. Well, as we look at this, I want us to notice each one of the characters of the parable that we're looking at. First and foremost, we see that we have the friend who is knocking on the door. And as you and I look at this friend who's knocking on the door, we look at this parable and we recognize, you know what? That represents each and every one of us. Because, believe it or not, we are inconvenient to God. Now, does that mean He doesn't love us? No, that doesn't mean He doesn't love us. He loves us, but God has to do a lot of work to keep me cleansed and to keep me clean. Believe me, I am high maintenance. And you know what? You're high maintenance as well. Jesus had to die on the cross so that you and I can have a chance to go to heaven. God had to work this world in a certain way so that you and I could have an opportunity to become His people. His providence works throughout us each and every day as you and I read in Genesis 49 and Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. We see where He's shaping the world. God is busy shaping the world to make sure where we go and to make sure how we live and to make sure that we have opportunities not only to be saved, but also to reach out and encourage other people. We're high maintenance. And so as you and I look, look at this, I want us to recognize that it is necessary for us to pray in the name of Christ. Well, what's it mean to pray in the name of Christ? Colossians 3, 17 tells us whatever we do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Christ. You go to Matthew chapter 6, we see there where we have to pray in His name. Well, obviously as a teaching tool, at the end of every prayer we say, in Jesus' name, Amen. That's not exactly what He's talking about when He talks about that. What Jesus means when He says we pray in His name is that we pray by His authority. 
We recognize he's the one that's in charge. We recognize that he is the one who guides us and leads us. We recognize that I can't make it and you can't make it and we can't make it unless God is there. And so that's why we get up at inconvenient times and we knock on that door. Now, as you and I look at this parable, we also see the homeowner, okay? And that's an uncaring person. Well, as you continue looking at how to apply this parable to us today, one thing that scares me is sometimes that represents me. And sometimes that represents you, right? I think about two years ago, uh, I had trouble with my little black car. It was overheating. And uh, it was hot outside, and it was hot in that car. And so I broke down in the Purchase Parkway. Well, it wasn't that big of a deal. I got the car fixed. Life was good. Still driving a little critter around. But it was funny because the next Sunday, I had four people that said, Hey, I saw you broken down on the side of the road. And I said, Well, thank you. Thank you for appreciating it. And three of them said, you were smiling at the time, so we didn't stop. And so I've learned when you break down, do not smile. Put that lip out. Okay? And maybe then they'll stop and they'll help you. Well, you know, why don't we stop when we see somebody? Sometimes it's dangerous, and I recognize that. But when I'm going somewhere down to Purchase Parkway, I'm going somewhere. I've got places to go, and I've got time, and I've got to be there, right? Why is it sometimes we don't spend a lot of time checking with people when they're having trouble? Because my life is way too busy. And I bet your life is way too busy. I love getting to go and visit retired people. Because you know what? There's nobody on this earth that's more busy than a retired person. It's just crazy. They stop working and suddenly they start doing things left and right. You know, you talk to a kid who should be just having fun and everything should be slow... And guess what? They're the busiest people around between ball practice and between school and homework and between all the other activities which they're doing. And every one of us are getting busier and busier and busier. Well, when you think about this, recognize my job and your job as a Christian is to care for other people. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And to love one another means that we are willing to be inconvenienced by other people. Sometimes when people in the church are caught in sin, one of the reasons why they're caught in sin is because the rest of us did not want to be inconvenienced. Sometimes when somebody in the Lord's church falls away, one of the reasons why they're allowed to fall away is because I and you and we did not want to be inconvenienced to go chase them down and beg them to return to the Lord. One of the reasons why sometimes we have those of our number who can become discouraged is because I'm too busy and you're too busy and we're too busy to lift one another up, to edify one another, and to help one another. Don't allow yourself to be inconvenienced by other people. What I mean by that is realize that's what we're here for. I am here to help people. You are here to help people. This church is here to encourage one another, to love one another, and to help one another so much more as we see that day approaching. And so when somebody's inconvenient, knocking in the middle of the night, now don't come to my house and knock in the middle of the night, but spiritually speaking, don't allow yourself to say, man, I just don't want to help. Recognize that if the Lord loved me enough, to help me, then I need to love other people enough to help them. Recognize that the Bible teaches that the way in which we forgive other people is the same way in which the Lord has promised to forgive us. Remember Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, where Jesus gave himself up and gave up his place in heaven and lived life as a man, and he gave himself up to death, even at death on a cross, as Philippians 2, 5 through 9. Recognize that as Jesus did that, so also you and I need to serve, in lowliness of mind, serve one another. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Now the third point we see here is the Father. And that represents our loving and our compassionate God. 
Recognize God is there to help you in every single situation that you face. You have not gone anywhere and you have not experienced anything that our Lord has not experienced. Now, sometimes I say, man, you know, I've got an iPhone and I've got a TV and I've got an automobile and Jesus never had any of those things. But we read in the book of Hebrews that Jesus, our high priest, has experienced everything that we've experienced. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus in Matthew 4 knew what it meant to be hungry. Jesus in John chapter 4 knew what it meant to be thirsty and to be alone. Jesus in John chapter 11 knew what it meant to be around those who were oppressed and to see oppression right in his midst. Jesus knew what it meant to be alone and to be stranded and to be persecuted. God knows whatever it is you're going through. And you know what? God loves you. And there is nothing in this world God wants more than to take care of you and to help you through everything that you're struggling with. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so we have a compassionate God. We have all the power in the world. We have all the ability in the world right there at our doorstep. But too often, I want to make it through life on myself. And too often, each and every one of us want to live independently of God. And we want to think, I can handle my struggles. And we want to think, I am strong enough and I am independent enough where I don't need anybody. God created us to be a communal people, to need one another. Adam was not made to survive in that garden by himself. He needed a help me. The church is not designed to exist of one person upon this earth. God created a church. We're not designed to live independently. We're designed to need help from other people, and we're designed to give help to other people. But God created us to need Him. It's that shape in our heart that can only be filled by the Lord. And if you didn't need God then Jesus wouldn't have needed to die on the cross for us. You need God. And so each and every one of us has to develop the courage to ask for help, to knock on that door, and to seek the loving and compassionate God to take care of us. Okay, let's look at some lessons which we learned from this parable. Lesson number one, prayer is not easy. We talked about that a little bit before. Luke chapter 11, verse 1, the apostles actually asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. Prayer is something that you and I have to learn to do. I had a second grade teacher who would always make us do cursive, and she always would say, we learn by doing. That still curdles my blood when I hear that phrase. We learn by doing. And you know what? I graduated, and now they say we don't need cursive. Teachers. All right, well, anyway... Prayer, you learn it by doing. You have to study it. You have to look at your prayer life. You have to practice at prayer. You remember the very first time you rode a bicycle? You may still have the scars from it, right? It was a difficult thing and something you had to work on each and every day. I remember the very first time in Rosenberg, Texas, we had our bicycle. I kept crashing it, and I kept getting angrier and angrier, and I even threw the bicycle a few times because I wanted to get on there, and I did not want to mess up. I wanted to ride it perfectly the very first time. Well, it took a while. It's not something that you can rush. It's not something that works simply, but it's something that you learn as you do it. If you're not a prayerful person, become one by the practice of prayer. Spend time with God a little bit more each day. And practice talking to God about those things that you're going through. Talk to Him about your enemies. Talk to Him about the situations you face. Talk to Him about your life and your goals and who you want to be and what you want to be. Practice praying to God. Prayer is not easy. Reference earlier in the lesson of James chapter 5 and verse 16, "...the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much." 
as you and I look through that, we see it's talking about Elijah. We're going back to 1 Kings chapter 18. Elijah was a man who prayed. And he prayed because God taught him to, God told him to, and it didn't rain for three years. And we see a little bit later that uh, Elijah would pray again. And as he prayed, he prayed harder and harder and harder, and that rain cloud appeared, and rain returned to the land. We look at Elijah's life, we see that prayer was hard. God didn't give it to him like, just like that, like a snap. It was something he had to work at, and something that he really had to do in order to grow. All right, let's look at our second lesson. We look here. Lesson number two is we must be faithful. Okay, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Be faithful even unto the point of death, and I will give you the crown of righteousness. As you and I read through our Bibles, we see there that promise given in the book of Revelation, talking about the importance of being absolutely faithful to God every time we have an opportunity, and making sure that we put Him first and foremost. Hebrews chapter 13, looking there in verses 5 and verses 6, we see in the end of verse 5, For he himself will never leave us nor forsake us. God is faithful. Therefore, what shall I fear? What can man do to me? Think about that. We've covered those verses a million times because you've heard my preaching here for almost four years, which is a scary thought, isn't it? What does it mean to be faithful? It means to trust in somebody when they're good and trust in somebody when they don't seem so good. To be faithful in marriage, to be faithful to your job, to be faithful to your Lord means that no matter what happens, you're going to stay right there and you're going to keep the relationship open. Now, one aggravating thing about prayer is that God is not a short order cook. You know, you get to go to a restaurant after church tonight, wherever it may be, if you eat after church, maybe a Dairy Queen or whatever it may be. And you can tell the lady that you want a hamburger without onions. I really don't know if Dairy Queen hamburgers have onions. Or you can tell the lady, I want my hamburger to have cheese. Or you can ask for fries or onion rings or whatever. And because you've walked into that store and because you're giving them money, you can demand to have whatever order you want. Now, being a fast food restaurant, you're lucky if you get what you want. But you can still order it, can't you? How many of us are that way with Christianity? God... I'm going to be faithful to you as long as you make me really, really rich. Or God, I'm going to keep coming to church as long as you make everybody in that church behave and they say what I want to hear and they're really friendly towards me. God, I'm going to give the way I should and I'm going to attend the way I should as long as you heal this cancer. You ever notice how sometimes in prayer we try to be God and try to make God the worshiper of us? You ever notice sometimes about how we try to be in charge? Now, is it wrong to pray about what you want? No, not at all. In fact, that's the point. Pray for what you want. Be selfish in your prayers. But recognize that you've got to be faithful. Whether God says yes, whether God says no, whether God says later, I'm going to be faithful to God, and I'm going to allow Him to be God, and I'm going to worship Him. We must be faithful to him and put him first. Okay, let's look at number three. Boy, I wish we could use this like three, the next three points. Because I think it's something very important for us to know. No one, no one loves you more than God does. You see... Everybody in this world is busy. And everybody in this world, in many ways, can be selfish. And everybody in this world, believe it or not, has an agenda oftentimes. And everybody in this world is not perfect. Don't put your faith in God in the preacher. Because the preacher is not perfect. Don't put your faith in God in this church. Because this church isn't perfect. We're perfected by Christ, but we're not perfect. But nobody, nobody loves you more than God. 
It's a verse that's become cliche because we quote it so much. But John 3.16 reminds us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And I shouldn't have walked over there because my microphone turned off. I'll walk back over here. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The godly died for the ungodly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For God made him who knew no sin, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might be found righteous in him. Now I could quote a hundred more verses to say the exact same thing, but you get the point. God loves you. And he wants to, as we read in that passage, give you that bread. He wants to give you that food. He wants to give you that egg because he's your father and he loves you and he is super, super proud to give you what you need. We are his handiwork. We are his project. And he loves us. He brags on us. And he's happy to please us. And so as you and I think about our prayer life, recognize that there's no one, no one who compares to God. All right, let's look at number four. This is another one that's tough. God knows best. In Romans chapter 9, in Romans chapter 10, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire is for Israel that they may be saved. Verse 2, I would give my soul to Israel if they would only be saved. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles who wrote much of the New Testament, said, I would put myself in that place to be lost if my nation could go to heaven. How many parents do we have who could say that same prayer about their children? I wish my children would come back to the Lord, they would say. I would give myself up. How many times can we, looking in our own life, say, oh, God if you would change it to this way, God, if you would just change these circumstances, everything would be wonderful. How many times have we thought that? How many times have we prayed that? And how many times have we needed that? But we take a step back, and by faith we proclaim, God knows best. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to His purposes. As you and I think about that passage, we see it's found in Romans 8, which gives us 39 reasons why we should be Christians. Romans chapter 8 is the center point, the highlight of the entire book of Romans. And as you and I read that verse, we say, okay, that sounds good because we're in a church building and life is pretty good right now. But when you're with a lady who's just lost her child... How can you say that verse? When you're talking to a person who's been diagnosed with a terrible disease, how can you say that verse? When you're struggling with an addiction and with a horrible sin and you're finding that you're not winning, how can you say that verse? We say that verse by faith because we know that God is in charge. And he rules, and he is over all things. Here's the old illustration of the Amish about the quilt. You look on the back of an Amish quilt before they put the backing and a padding on it. And it looks super confused because you have strings and knots going everywhere. You have loose ends and all these things. And the Amish will tell you, that's what our life looks like today. There's a lot of knots, there's a lot of loose ends, there's a lot of strings going in strange places, and we can never see what in the world is going on. But that sweet lady keeps sewing, and that sweet lady keeps stitching, and when she puts on the backing, she turns it around, and we see the perfect log cabin or whatever pattern she's followed. And we see the quilt, which is worth hundreds of dollars. In the same way you and I look at our life today, and there's a lot of things in this world that do not make sense to me. 
And I don't see how God is working these things. And I don't see how God is working here and there or wherever. And I think, God, even where are you? But on that final day, when we step into heaven, we'll see the finished product. And we'll see the hand of God is there. In the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk wrestles with God and he says, why are you letting the wealthy oppress the the poor folk? Later he says, how can a good God use the Chaldeans or the Babylonians? And Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 tells us, the righteous man shall live by his faith. That verse works as the center point of three New Testament books. Hebrews in chapter 9, Galatians in chapter 3, and Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. It's the center point of the New Testament. The just man shall live by his faith. Or we had said in our language, recognize that God is in charge. And he knows best. Was it a good thing that hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed by the Babylonians? No. But God worked that to cleanse his people and to bring forth the Savior. Was it a good thing that the early Christians were persecuted and many of them lost their lives? No. But God worked through it in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 as the church spread because everyone was scattered preaching the word of God. God knows best. And love him and be faithful to him and recognize that he will see you through whatever it is that you face. All right, let's look at number five. And I'm now out of room, so this will be our last one. Just kidding, it's our last one anyway. Let's look again at that obnoxious person who didn't want to get out of bed. And let's make sure that person's not us in that parable. Our compassion must reflect God's compassion. We oftentimes, when we're talking about evangelism, hear that old saying, The only Bible most people will ever read is the life of a Christian. And that's true when we're talking non-Christians, because a lot of them are ignorant of what the Bible teaches, and their only idea of what a New Testament Christian should look like is the life that we live. But let's take that saying a little bit further. One of the best ways that your neighbor sees God each and every day is the life and the love that you show. Voltaire was one of the leaders, the instigators of the French Revolution, and he was an avid, avid atheist. Many of the things that uh, Penn Gillette, many of the things that Richard Dawkins have written in their books are nothing more than a regurgitation of Voltaire. It's pretty interesting. People who are against God are very rarely creative in any way. But Voltaire would tell his people, and he would say oftentimes many dumb things. One time he said, by the end of my life, There will be libraries of my books, and not a single person will own a Bible any longer. But how many of us in our house have a Voltaire volume? Maybe some people who study philosophy, but we have Bibles today, don't we? Well, anyway, back to our lesson. Voltaire, one of the things he said is the strongest argument against the existence of God is found on the face of a Christian. Because you never see him smile. That's a horrible thing to hear, isn't it? But is it true of us? And taking that a little further, perhaps one of the strongest arguments against God would be the lack of compassion found in the Lord's church. How much do you love your neighbor? How much do you love that person sitting in the pew next to you? I'm not talking about your husband or wife or child. I'm talking about just random people who are around you. How much do we show love? One of the awesome things about our congregation here is that we sit here forever talking in this auditorium. Bugs Tom to death because we'll never go to bed. He has to find somebody to turn out the lights. And that's aggravating, but it's good because the people here love each other enough that they're involved in each other's lives. We see a great youth group and great children's group growing up. As they're running around here in the auditorium, in the hallways, and in the gym, they're growing up involved in each other's lives because of love which is shown for one another. Many times uh, our senior saints will go on trips, and that's great because it helps us to be involved in the lives of one another. But recognize what Jesus says. 
The way in which we forgive is a measure in which God will forgive us. Recognize in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 that we have an obligation, a command to love one another. Strengthen those parts of the body that are struggling. Help those parts of the body that are beginning to fall away. Be sure that you talk to people that are not in your group. If you're younger, take an opportunity to get to know someone who's older. If you're older, take an opportunity to get to know somebody who is younger. If you've been a member here since Moses walked down this aisle, and I'm not sure he did, but I bet he did in the last church building. If you've been a member that long, Get to know some of these folks who are new to church here. Tell them that you love them and get to know their lives and get to know the names of their kids. Our compassion must reflect God's compassion. You see, Jesus answered that, that question or that command in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. And he taught his disciples to pray. And as you and I read there, we see, of course, the model prayer... But we also see in this lesson that we need to be willing to get God's attention and pray to Him. We see that for our prayers to be answered, we must be willing to be compassionate to other people. And we see that in our prayers, we must recognize God loves us and He wants what's best for us. Let's let that be our final thought as we go to our invitation. You see, God wants you and me to go to heaven. We read in John chapter 14 that he has prepared a place for us in those mansions of gold. The only thing keeping us out is us. And so before we leave this building tonight and go into the world, let's be sure that we have obeyed the gospel of Christ. You see, God's already paid for your soul with his son. Let's be sure that as we enter into waters of baptism, that we respond to that gift through our obedience. This evening, recognize that as a church, we love one another. And if you need the prayers of the saints, and if you need the encouragement of the saints, recognize when you respond to the invitation, that's not a sign of weakness, but it's a sign that you need love, and we're willing to give it. Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward while we stand and while we sing.
and I have to go to the library and for that purpose. Just uh, while they're go leaving, turn to 600 and uh, 56. today be able to come to worship you and we declare you God of all creation and we thank you for creating us father and we pray uh, that as uh, your people as your Christians that we can unite and that we can be closer together here as a body and we pray for um, our leaders and the elders and deacons we pray for them father we pray that you will um, give them courage and strength father uh, Lord, as we learn uh, today, we pray that we can have a repentant heart, um, that when we see ourselves against your word, that we can turn from our evil ways and our own desires and turn back to you and, and have a desire to uh, want to know more of you. And we thank you for the blessings that we have in Jesus. We know that he came to, to die on our, uh, on our behalf on the cross, and we thank you for the forgiveness that we have in that and the grace we know that you are um, very faithful to us and we thank you for that we know that you will never leave us and lord we uh, we can't thank you enough and help us this week as we um, go about our lives to be a prayer for people to uh, to be disciplined in our prayer lives to to want our cup to overflow with with your love and in your presence we pray that we can do that we thank you for, um, again, for Jesus and the life that we have in him. And we pray this in his name. And amen. We're dismissed. <laughs>